everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Total Soccer Show. Uh, I am your host, Taylor Rockwell. Daryl Grove is not with me today, but that is okay, because I've got a man with all of the knowledge uh, on the line to talk to me. It's Mickey Turner. Mickey is a Washington-based lawyer. He's a Seattle Sounders fan and writes about the Seattle Sounders. He also writes about the kind of intersection of soccer and law. He does that for websites like The Athletic, as well as for his own site, SoccerESQ.com. Uh, he's got a great kind of running tally of all of the many lawsuits involving soccer in the United States, many of which involve David Beckham, many of which involve U.S. soccer. We'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about training compensation and solidarity payments. We'll talk about the women's national team lawsuit against U.S. soccer, many, many, many other legal issues to get to. So I will just turn it over to me asking questions to Mickey. Joining me now, I've got my friend and yours, Mr. Mickey Turner, I guess unless you've gone against him in court, in which case maybe he's not your friend, but uh, Mickey is a a (laughs) Washington-based lawyer, writes about the Sounders, does a lot of uh, excellent writing for The Athletic, specifically writing about uh, law and the, I guess, the intersection of law and soccer. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, that's a fair way to put it, and uh, good to talk to you and uh, be back on the show again. Yeah, so I think you previously talked to Daryl. I think that may have been about the Crossfire lawsuit, which uh, may come up in this conversation. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, gosh, that was uh, a year ago, it seems like, uh, the first when, time I talked to him. Yeah, was that when the decision was imminent? <laughs> yes, yeah, quote-unquote imminent. Is, uh, it, it is still imminent, uh, according to their attorney. <laughs> that, that sounds sounds right. Uh, so I want to get to that one, but I want to start off uh, with David Beckham. Uh, how many lawsuits has David Beckham had against him, and how does he keep winning them? I'm kind of fascinated by this. Well, uh, so there are currently six lawsuits against Beckham in one form or another. One of them, <laughs> to be fair, is not technically a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the uh, Inter, Inter Milan versus Inter Miami uh, trademark dispute. It's not a lawsuit per se, but mm-hmm. it's still a challenge, a legal challenge, I guess. So the total, if you include that one, is six. And yeah, he has a, uh, a shockingly good record. He is basically undefeated in court uh with all of these lawsuits uh, thus far. So it's it's quite incredible. But how big a role do you think these lawsuits and like overall legal, maybe not troubles, maybe not battles, but just kind of legal issues, do you think they've played a big role in forcing him to look to Fort Lauderdale as a possible destination? Uh, yeah, I would say that the, uh, not so much the legal front, mm-hmm. um, but it's the political front down there in Miami has just made it incredibly difficult to get anything done. Part of this was Beckham's own making in the first place when he came in to announce his first uh, plot of land, which was uh, in the, you know, in the Marina, Port Miami, I think it was. And that went nowhere fast because a bunch of interest, uh, the the Caribbean cruise lines basically said, uh, no, you're not building anything near us. Um, And then he went to find like three or four different other places. And that took like two years, basically. So by the time they finally settled on the Overton site, uh, they brought Jorge Moss on board, and then he decided, well, I don't like that site, so we're going to move somewhere else. And that's when they moved to Mel Reese, uh, the golf course, and that's when they're dealing with the uh, city of Miami. And then when they realized that wasn't going to go particularly well and was going to take a long time, that's when they moved to Fort Lauderdale. So it's been more on the, on the moves from uh, Miami to Fort Lauderdale. It's more the political side of things. But the legal issues haven't helped. Um, they've certainly delayed things. But again, he's won all the lawsuits. But again, people keep filing them, um, which keeps uh, you know delaying things. And, and speaking of that, uh, am I correct in saying that there's been a lawsuit filed in Fort Lauderdale or relating to Fort Lauderdale as well? Yeah, yeah. And so this is uh, kind of an interesting one. So basically what happened once they realized that um, Mel Reese wasn't going to happen and some of the other options weren't feasible, they were they were at least looking at uh, Florida International University's uh, stadium and maybe Florida Atlantic, although those didn't go particularly far, but they were at least you know considering them. Uh, but once they decided that they, they needed a place to play in 2020, uh, they decided to go to Fort Lauderdale and try to make a bid to tear down Lockhart and build a temporary stadium while they tried to get their re- you know their formal stadium in Melrose over the line. At the same time, there was another uh, organization, FXE Football, which had been negotiating or at least putting together a proposal with the city of Fort Lauderdale for well over a year. Um, and they were not happy to see Beckham kind of big time them and come in at the last minute. And it was the last minute. They didn't even propose anything until the end of January of this year um, and got a deal done, as everyone now knows, uh, at, you know, at the end of February or early March. 
So that royally uh, pissed <laughs> off FXC football. And they think that, uh, or they've alleged that there's been some irregularities with how the, uh, how the decision was made um, and some other, you know, other violations of this uh, Fort Lauderdale charter. Um, and basically have decided, yeah, this is not uh, something we can abide. And so, yeah, they filed a lawsuit. Now, it's, it, there's a couple of interesting things about the lawsuit. Um, number one, they're trying to prevent Beckham from immediately demolishing Lockhart because, as uh, most uh, of your listeners probably know at this point, with Miami set to come in in 2020, they need a stadium to play in, and they're going to do one of those modular stadiums, which can be done in you know four to six months. So that can be done before the start of March 2020. But you got to get started doing that now. You got to start uh, demolishing, getting permits and all that stuff, and get the construction done. So they need to demolish immediately, and so they're trying to demolish, start demolishing or demolition on May 6th. But they don't have a formal agreement with Fort Lauderdale yet to build a stadium, you know, manage the stadium, and all that kind of stuff. You need to to operate a, a, a large complex like that. So FXC is uh, filed for an injunction to prevent that demolition from taking place while this lawsuit's ongoing. And I think their chances of winning the injunction are at least decent because, again, how can you agree to demolish something before you have the agreement in place? Yeah. And there are specific laws in place that say you have to have the full agreement before you start and go ahead with construction like this. So I think they've got a decent case on that. But as in all cases, it depends how the court sees things. Um, and we don't know what MLS and Inter Miami's response is as of yet. So, but that's going to, you know, it's April 25th as we're talking. Um, and if they start demolition on May 6th, that means we've got to be in court next week uh, to figure out uh, what the court's going to do. So uh, it, uh, it's going to, we're going to find out something here real quick. And, and this may be a question that I end up asking you several times in this uh, interview, but like how standard is this for a sort of like, like expansion team in any sport, having to find a new home, having to build a new stadium, like is this fairly standard in terms of the legal obstacles they're facing, or like, and are we just getting more attention on it because it's Beckham, because it's Major League Soccer, because it's Miami? Is this a like a u- problem unique to Miami, or is it something more common that maybe just doesn't always get the headlines it gets in this case? Well, I think what you're uh, fond of saying things can be two things. There we go. And, there we uh, go. <laughs> where this, that's where this that's where this falls in. I'd say the answer is yes to okay. all of that, essentially. <laughs> all right. Um, but uh, to break it down a little further, um, I would say that uh, Miami and Beckham have pa- uh, faced some fairly unprecedented obstacles in trying to get this done, especially for, and this is to be fair to them, especially for a proposal where they're proposing to to front essentially all of the cost of construction. This is one of those cases where the city is, is investing, you know, 10 to 50 to a hundred million dollars in a stadium at no point throughout this process has Beckham done anything, uh, but offer to pay for this on its own. And so in that way, it's a little, uh, perplexing the level of, of opposition and scrutiny he's, he's, uh, he's faced. Now, some of that is due to, uh, you know, local interests just wanting to protect their turf, so to speak. Some of it is due, obviously, to concerns about uh, what uh, what the construction would do to the community. And some of it is your good old-fashioned NIMBYism. Um, and so mm-hmm. all of those things have kind of conspired, along with the fact you're trying to deal with building in Miami, which has some notorious corruption issues, uh, to make things much more difficult than um, it's been in other places. All of the, you know, every place has some limited amount of that kind of stuff. But I, I, I tweeted, you know, maybe a, a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was during an LAFC game that it was remarkable how easily LAFC got their stadium built from, you know, start to finish. It was basically done in two and a half to three years and there was no opposition whatsoever. And you're dealing with building in LA, which is hardly any easier than building in Miami. But so uh, you know, again, they face some unprecedented co- um, obstacles, I would say. I think it's fair to say. Um, but all locations at least face some of that. But, it, you know, I think Beckham's got some fair gripes that uh, this has been a bit over the top. And then, like, I feel 
as bad as you could feel for David Beckham, given that he is a millionaire many, many times over. But like he announces this like, th- OK, fine. Like we'll deal with the stadiums later, but at least we've got this great logo, this great name. It's going to be perfect. And then the Inter Miami, Inter Milan trademark deal uh, happens, uh, which is one I found interesting. My wife found fascinating. It sounds like there won't be anything decided on that kind of trademark issue until late 2020 is what I think I saw you wrote. Can you give our listeners like a little bit more background about what's going on there and maybe what your expectations are for how it plays out? Yeah, so that's an interesting case. And, you know, I ultimately, to, to jump to the end briefly, I think this is a case that Inter Miami probably eventually wins. Okay. Um, but to, to start at the beginning, uh, Inter Milan, which is obviously the famous uh, Italian side, uh, filed for a trademark protection for their uh, for the Inter name uh, back in 2016. And, you know, it went through the process. And then there were some objections noted primarily by MLS. Uh, because they don't want that trademark to be protected uh, because they want to use the name for themselves, obviously. Um, and there's, you know, there's some, there's some meat to their, to their argument. I, I, would, I think, again, it's fair to say um, in that, you know, there are a number of teams within name enter in their name and Inter Milan hasn't gone after any of them. Um, I, again, to be fair, they're not necessarily going after Inter Miami in this case. It's MLS that filed the objection. Um but the argument, it, it's, it's similar to a case that happened, uh, I want to say, about a year and a half ago when uh, the Detroit, uh, you know, the MLS team that's trying to come into or was trying to come into Detroit tried to uh, trademark Detroit City SC when there is already a Detroit City FC. And they tried to um, say that there was a difference because the FC and the SC made it so no one would know. And everyone could tell the difference, essentially. Mm. And the trademark office basically said, no, those are basically the same thing. And so you can't come in here and try to try to trademark that. Um, again, in this case, um, Inter Miami, there's a or Inter Milan, there's a bunch of inners all over the world. And most people think this is more about Inter Milan trying to protect a trademark um, in, so that they don't lose it if a more serious challenge comes up. So let's say someone came up with the name Inter Milan of – uh, Chicago or something mm-hmm. like that, or Inter Milan of uh, uh, Barcelona or, or something along those lines. Yeah, so I, got you. I think that's more along the lines of what they're trying to do. They're just trying to protect their trademarks so they don't lose it if a more serious challenge comes up. But I'm, I think it's unlikely that they're going to win this one. And so MLS will likely win this uh, eventually. It just may take right. a while, but there's no indication to me that they're not going to be able to use the name in the meantime. So uh, this is probably not much to do about nothing ultimately. So like 20 or 30 years from now, if Wikipedia still exists and the world still exists, um, do we think that like Inter- Inter-Miami's Wikipedia page is going to be like after initial challenges, Inter-Miami like play their first few seasons in Fort Lauderdale before eventually moving to a stadium in Miami? Does that sound about where it's going to go? <laughs> yeah, I'd say that's uh, exactly where it's going to go, okay. assuming that uh, the world still exists. <laughs> and Florida is still above water. Oh, there we go. That's another one I should have added in there. <laughs> um, then my next question for you is this. Given what we've already talked about, who has better lawyers, David Beckham or U.S. soccer? Ooh, that's a good, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I mean, Beckham at this point is undefeated, um, although U.S. soccer's record uh, with lawsuits is pretty good as well. I'm, I'm, I can't think off the top of my head one that they, you know, quote unquote, lost recently. Uh, you know, they've done pretty well in the NASL lawsuit. Uh, they've, uh, you know, I'm sure a lawsuit we may talk about here in a minute. They, uh, they won the Champions World lawsuit, which has to go deal with bringing uh, events, uh, foreign events to MLS uh, soil. And so they, they uh, flex their muscle, I, I think it's fair to say, in a number of instances and haven't really been challenged uh, successfully uh, by anyone at that point. So it's, uh, it's definitely up in the air. It's a toss up. Well, let, let's start there then with the Champions World. Is that the relevant sports one? That's correct. Okay, yeah. C- can you can you talk a bit about that one? Because I guess the one I was going to go to uh, next was training competition solidarity, but that's more Major League Soccer. I think U.S. Soccer desperately trying to avoid being drawn into that one. So yeah, let's let's talk <laughs> yeah. relevant first. Okay, so uh, that is a uh, this is kind of the rematch of the Champions World case, uh, which was filed. I think I want to say 2010, give or take. I may be off uh, a year or so on that. But it was basically a company that uh, likes to put on uh, events in the United States, uh, bring foreign teams here. And they, uh, Relevant has done it successfully over the past what, five years uh, with the International um, Champions Cup, bringing a bunch of massive teams over here to, uh, to 
you know, have ex- exhibition games, massive crowds, made a lot of money for everybody. But Relevant has long wanted to get into the business of bringing uh, foreign teams playing regular season games in the U.S. They uh, tried to get uh, a La Liga game here last year. That didn't go anywhere, although that was more FIFA, which we can probably talk about a little bit. Um, and so this most recent, and they also wanted to do the Copa Libertadores final, uh, which was the one that was yeah, marred right, by right. Uh, uh, violence in Argentina. And there were some rumblings they wanted to bring that to Miami. That didn't go anywhere, and it ended up going overseas. Uh, and so most recently, they wanted to bring in two Ecuadorian teams, uh, at the, uh, uh, Barcelona Sporting Club, uh, speaking of trademarks, and Guayaquil <laughs> City FC uh, to bring in uh, to play in the United States. And they had a game scheduled for Miami on May 5th. Um, they put in their application for uh, with U.S. Soccer, and they're essentially accusing the federation of slow playing a uh, decision on that, uh, so that it doesn't happen before the May fifth date. Which it doesn't seem that that's something that is likely to happen um, at this point. And so, uh, once they determined uh, that they didn't think that U.S. Soccer was going to give them a timely answer, they filed uh, a lawsuit, basically alleging that U.S. Soccer is overstepping the authority that they can't really deny these applications as long as all the rules that are uh, rules have been followed. Um, and the only reason they can really deny um, an application from a company to bring a game over here is if the U S soccer determines it's not in the best interest of the sport. And so the question there is number one is, is U S soccer uh, going to make that formal determination that it's not in the best interest of the sport. And more generally, uh, what, uh, how much latitude does U.S. soccer have in, uh, you know, either approving or denying these applications? Relevant basically says that uh, U.S. Ro- U.S. soccer's role is more ministerial in that they're basically supposed to take make sure all the check marks or check boxes are are marked, and if they are, then they don't really have a basis to deny uh, a game from going on here. But uh, U.S. soccer says that uh, FIFA has more of a, a role in this. Uh, then uh, relevant is 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 arguing, and that no, you know, the general rule is that foreign teams should play their games in their home countries, mm-hmm. and they shouldn't be going uh, gallivanting all around the world, uh, putting on regular season games uh, in other countries. And there is an argument that that kind of thing could, uh, you know, prove detrimental to the sport in the in the United States, at least the domestic sport, not you know, not the growth of soccer that would obviously have a uh, positive impact. Um, bringing more uh, people out to, to watch soccer games here could hardly be considered detrimental, but whether it's detrimental to the domestic game is another issue. And so I think that's, that again, that's the, the macro or the micro determination that U.S. soccer would have to make. But the more uh, global issue is whether uh, people should be playing regular season games in foreign countries instead of their home, home countries. Well, one question I have there, though, is like, Again, not a lawyer, so forgive me. But like with U.S. soccer sort of already facing a couple different legal challenges, then this one comes in from relevant. Can you like like if you're like a person or a company or a nonprofit, I guess like like and you're fighting all these different issues, different battles, and then more come in. Is there a way to just say like, hey, we don't have time for this right now? Can you get sort of like a continuance on that ground, or do you have like a set amount of time that you have to deal with something or respond to something before you're then I don't know in trouble with court? Uh, well, there, yeah, there could be, I mean, they could have some sort of, it would depend on the, on the case you're dealing mm-hmm. with. Um, basically saying, you know, your, your court, yeah, court congestion, mm-hmm. uh, would be, you know, is a thing, but that's typically with the courts, not with the people prosecuting gotcha. cases. Um, and, you know, U.S. soccer as a nonprofit entity, they've got a big legal department, as we talked <laughs> about, they're very talented and smart attorneys. Um, and if they need to outsource, uh, you know, to other firms to get, bring them in to handle these suits. They are certainly capable of doing that. They've got the budget to do so, although that is much to their consternation. I can tell you that from having talked with them. Uh, you know, I think uh, my last look uh, at their financials, they were spending about $4 million on attorney's fees last year. And that number is likely to go up this year because uh, I don't, I think only one of the cases has been resolved uh, regarding the NASL. Um, and it was kind of a secondary case, but uh, with all of the additional cases, they're definitely not, uh, they're adding, not subtracting. So, um, yeah, they, they, if if they need more attorneys, they're going to have to go out and hire them because right. that's not a base to, to uh, hold off on filing a lawsuit. 
We'll get back to my conversation with Mickey Turner in just a second. I should say Mickey Turner's explanation of all things to me. It's more that than a conversation. I'll get back to him in just a moment. But first, I wanted to let you know that today's show is brought to you in part by The Athletic. Uh, We have mentioned it several times uh, with Mickey. He does write for The Athletic. uh, But they are also a sponsor on today's show. Uh, The Athletic is where you can go for excellent content about the sport you love, the teams you love, the players you love. Uh, But you're also getting uh, like in-depth coverage of specific issues. You've got Sam Steschko talking about like what MLS needs to do or what steps are being taken to sort of fix major markets uh, and maybe maybe how there should be a little bit more attention on sort of developing the supporters culture there and the kind of enthusiasm for the teams there rather than expanding. But, you know, I'll let you read that and decide for yourself. Uh, Cesar Hernandez wrote a great piece about the work done by LAFC, specifically Pride Republic and the 3252 to eradicate uh, that chant that we all know and do not enjoy. Uh, they've done a, a good job of that, but it requires requires ongoing work, and they talk about kind of the steps they've taken to make that happen. And of course, you can find great breaking news from folks like Mickey Turner, from people like Paul Tenorio, many, many other wonderful writers there. I think uh, Paul and Mickey Turner, when the training compensation and solidarity payments news broke, like had an explainer up on it in like an hour. That's how good they are. So if you would like to see what The Athletic has on offer, you can do so, and you can get 40% off by going to theathletic.com slash April. Once again, that's theathletic.com slash TSS April for 40% off an annual subscription. I also wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you in part by Roughneck Scarves, our old friends over at Roughneck Scarves. They've been with us forever. They'll stay with us forever. That's a threat and a promise. Um, Mickey and I have talked a little bit about the Miami Beckhams and the situation going on there. I don't think you can yet buy uh, an MLS scarf for the Miami Beckhams since, you know, you've got the trademark issues going on. You've got uh, where they're going to play. Is it the Fort Lauderdale Beckhams now? Is it inter-Miami Fort Lauderdale? Uh, We'll wait, and then I'm sure Roughneck will have scarves available for you. But you can get scarves for, say, the women's national team, the individual players on the women's national team. If you want to show support and solidarity for their lawsuit, uh, you could do so by getting a scarf to show that you're supporting each individual player. Uh, You're going to have to spend a lot of money to get each individual player's scarf, but if you want to show support, that's the best way to do it. Of course, uh, the like, exorbitant cost of buying every single player scarf could be reduced somewhat uh, by using the promo code Total Soccer Show for twenty percent off. Uh, that's Total Soccer Show, all one word, all uppercase at RoughneckScarves.com. R U F F N E C K Scarves.com. I'm assuming you can spell scarves, uh, but as we said previously, they've got uh, pretty much every like national team you could think of covered in their shop. So if you want to get a, a scarf for a team in the Copa America, a scarf for a team in the Gold Cup a scarf for a team in the Women's World Cup, a scarf for a team in the Africa Cup of Nations, maybe in the U-20 World Cup. They've got many, many options out there so you can support uh, any team that your heart might so desire. Uh, so Roughneck Scarves once again has you covered, and the discount code is Total Soccer Show for 20% off. Thank you to Roughneck Scarves for sponsoring today's episode of the Total Soccer Show. Now back to Mickey Turner having all of the knowledge. The U.S. Women's National Team uh, recently filed a suit against U.S. Soccer. What does that new complaint argue? Uh, And also, it seems very, very similar from what I've read, mostly from you, I should be honest. Uh, From what I've (laughs) read, it seems very, very similar to the suit uh, filed individually by Hope Solo. So I'm curious why they didn't decide to file together when Hope Solo first filed. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, And it's complicated. It has to do some, uh, some to do with just the the personal dynamics between Hope Solo and the women's national team. Uh, she is, you know, I'm not going to say a persona non grata, but she is not on the same you know page with the women's national team at this point. She was uh, uh, unceremoniously let go mm-hmm. after some criticism after the Olympics uh, and obviously had some personal issues that she was dealing with at the time. And then further uh, ran against uh, or ran for U S soccer president um, and basically lit the room on fire in, in her speeches. And so that probably yep. did not put her in good standing with uh, uh, some of the other uh, you know, women's national team players or the Federation, generally speaking. So um, the, to answer your question, the lawsuits are essentially identical. She okay. is alleging most everything that the women's national team um, writ large is, is, is alleging in their suit regarding equal pay, uh, flights, uh, playing conditions, uh, marketing sponsorships, all of that stuff is essentially the same. The only difference is Hope Solo filed her case about six months ahead of the women's national team, and the reason, you know, 
the reason the women's national team waited in part is because there was a, uh, a an investigation going on by the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I believe that's right. Um, and they had to go through that process before they could sue. Basically, they had to exhaust their administrative remedies before they could go file a lawsuit. And so they had to wait for that to get done. And that didn't get done until February when they, uh, the EEOC finally announced that they weren't taking any action on the uh, on the women's national team complaints. And Hope Solo was a part of that initial complaint. Hope Solo just decided not to wait any longer because she hadn't gotten an answer. And to be fair, the EEOC had uh, taken it about two and a half years uh, before making a decision. So uh, Solo just got tired and just decided to go to court. And so that could put her suit in some jeopardy just because she didn't exhaust uh, the administrative remedies. But the bottom line is that the suits are basically identical. They'll probably be consolidated. Uh, I did ask for US, uh, U.S. Soccer actually for an update on that. And basically things are we're waiting to see what happens with the consolidation, which is supposed to happen next month. Uh, I think it's around May 6th. Uh, through the 12th, somewhere in that range. We'll get an answer if these, number one, if these suits are going to be consolidated, and number two, where these suits are going to be held, because there are three potential places uh, where this suit could ultimately be litigated. Solo filed hers in St. Louis or uh, San, San Francisco. Uh, the women's national team filed theirs in Los Angeles, and U.S. Soccer wants to have it in Chicago, which is uh, where they're, they're headquartered. So we've got all that stuff to figure out before we even get to the merits of the lawsuit. Uh, and so uh, we've got a, we've still got a little ways to go before we figure out uh, where we're gonna where we're gonna hear this case. And is it the case that like given like like appoint, uh, appointees to the courts, is there one of those three where maybe it would be more likely for the court to rule in like the U.S. women's favor? Is it where they filed it? Do you think that's why they chose to file it there? Uh, well, you know, U.S. Soccer would obviously like to have it near their headquarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for convenience sake, that's where the, some of the witnesses will be for that case. The women would obviously like it to be uh, in Los Angeles because that's where they're headquartered um, and that's where their practices generally are. Um, so and then a lot of players live in that area. Um, I, I have to look back again why Hope Solo filed hers in San Francisco. I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure that there may have been a bit of foreign sh- form shopping to have a favorable uh, court potentially to, to hear that. But I, I don't want to you know, fully ascribe that as a reason. Um, so okay. it's, it's, I'm not sure which one would be more beneficial to each of the parties, uh, but my guess is we'll end up either in Los Angeles or Chicago. All right. Uh, and then once they get through the consolidation issues, then they're going to have to start looking at the actual complaint. Uh, in your Twitter thread on the issue, you pulled one part, uh, which I think had the following quote. Uh, a representative of the U.S. Soccer Federation admitted that the USSF has and will continue to have a practice of gender-based pay discrimination. The rep pronounced, uh, quote, market realities are such that women do not deserve to be paid equally to the men, end quote. Uh, once again, I am not a lawyer, but for a number of reasons, <laughs> that seems like a very stupid thing to have allegedly said oh yeah that was definitely one of the things that stood out from um from the complaint and you know to be to be clear that is an allegation raised by the women's national team yeah um and uh i'm sure is going to eventually be denied or explained away by u.s soccer although not 100 percent, because i think they have acknowledged that there is some there is a financial component to the reason that the disparities exist and obviously, what we're talking about here is that the you know allegedly the men bring in a lot more money than the women. Although, according to the complaint, uh, the women in at least a couple of years have have been responsible for the profit that the uh, federation saw, primarily after the World Cup year and the victory tour brought in a lot of money uh, for the federation. I think took them from a net uh, deficit to a to a surplus in that year. So. Uh, there is there's certainly an argument to be made that that's not 100 percent true, that the men are always bringing in much more money than the women. But uh, I think that's you know, the argument, obviously, from the Federation is that the men obviously bring in a lot more money. And, and that's uh, you know, that's the reason for the disparities in pay. That said, that's not necessarily a legal defense to a pay mm-hmm. discrimination claim, uh, especially as outlined um, in the uh, in the Equal Pay Act uh, as well. So, uh, again, not very bright if that was actually said, uh, and I'm sure we're going to hear about it from the person who actually said it when he or she gets deposed. Uh, so we'll, we'll see whoever said that. I'm sure they're uh, not going to be too popular with U.S. soccer and with a lot of other people. Mm. So we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> no. Um, but I'm also wondering, like, like – 
So it's U.S. women's national team is filing this suit. The Women's World Cup is coming up. There's going to be like times when they're going to have to deal with the U.S. Soccer Federation and executives. And I'm sure Carlos Cordero will want to do a photo shoot with them before they go to France. And if they win, he'll certainly want to. Like I, I know that this is like you're always sort of when you when you're dealing with legal stuff. There's always sort of the stuff that's happening with the lawyers in the courts, and then the stuff that's happening between individuals. I'm wondering, is there like will there be sort of steps taken that like Megan Rapinoe shouldn't talk to Carlos Cordero? except about like the performances on the field like are there sort of stipulations in place that will not necessarily prevent but like advise players not to be in situations where they're discussing this or is that that not something that they're necessarily concerned about when it comes to this lawsuit yeah i don't think they're very they're overly concerned and that's an excellent question um and i actually uh when i was writing up the previous stories i i, I talked to u.s soccer a little bit about this and they're what they're what they told me is that the relationship with the women's national team is, is, is solid. Uh, let me put it as uh, describe it as solid. They still talk to each other, even without the law or even with the lawsuit going on. Um, it, and it doesn't have to do with the lawsuit. I'm sure their attorneys have advised them not to, not to speak specifically about the lawsuit. Um, even though I'm sure those things come up in a kind of an off offhand way, but, uh, the Federation described the, the relationship as, so, as solid and they, uh, they, I don't think there will be any issues with them doing photo shoots. I think they've done some marketing things. You, the Federation has promoted some of the women's uh, uh, you know, sponsorships and marketing things as well. So uh, you know, I'm sure there are some hard feelings underneath the surface, but I think they're going to do their uh, best to put their best foot forward and put on a good display, especially with the world uh, going to be watching uh, for a month in June uh, while they try to bring home another World Cup title so uh like it's a good question but i think the the bottom line is that they're professionals and they'll they will uh they will do what needs to be done so uh then the next steps would be figure out where it's where they're gonna like actually have the arguments uh la san francisco or chicago and then if the cases will be consolidated and then what's the next step after that Okay, so yeah, so uh, there hasn't been any any response from the federation to the lawsuit, which is totally not surprising because again, they they haven't even decided where they're going to have the case yet. Uh, so once that's all figured out, then the federation will have to answer the lawsuit, answer each of the allegations raised by the women, um, or they can also file uh, some type of motion to uh, have the case dismissed. Um, you know, they would file basically saying even if uh, everything is taken in the complaints is true, there's not a case here. Um, and go from there and then argue that, argue that motion. Once that is either uh, accepted or rejected, and we'll assume that their motion to dismiss would be rejected, then you would start with basically discovery in the case, uh, you know, deposing people, exchanging documents, and, and all that fun stuff. And then, you know, they'll try to get a trial date set as well. Uh, again, that's probably not, that, you know, given that the Federation is already tied up with a number of lawsuits, uh, that may not be for a couple of years, and that's not surprising. Uh, the NASL lawsuit is now uh, we're on coming into year three um, here uh, at the at the end of the at the end of summer, and so these federal lawsuits typically take a long time to resolve. So I wouldn't expect anything to actually happen as far as being in trial and getting people on the stand um, until probably late 2020, early 2021 at the earliest. Um, and it's just, you know, these federal cases, especially on cases like this, take a lot of time uh, to, to get all the documentation together um, and, and get all the witnesses to post. And keep in mind, we're talking about, uh, what, 29 uh, plaintiffs in this case with the potential to go all the way up to 50. And that's right. the other thing we have to also have to see if this if this is gets uh, certified as a class action lawsuit or whether they uh, are suing it as essentially a group of individuals. Um, that doesn't have any necessarily any effect on the timeline, but just affects how the case is uh, heard. So lots to, still to be figured out with a fairly long timeline there. If you need a, like, further examples, or listeners want further examples of how these things can kind of take some time, it's one we already talked about earlier, but the crossfire decision was a like, decision expected in what, late 2018? Or late, was, was it late 2018 or late 2017 yeah. that they were looking for? I believe it was the first, the first, yeah, the first date was October 26th, uh, give or take a couple of days. Okay, That's cool. when it was first imminent uh, before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. 
All right. and or that, DRC, excuse me. Yeah, I got you. So uh, MLS, uh, for their part, recently reversed their position on training compensation solidarity payments that came with the Crossfire lawsuit still awaiting decision. Do you think MLS maybe saw the way the wind was blowing or maybe saw that like maybe they kind of got an implica- like an indication that this was not going to go their way and they tried to get out in front of things? Yeah, so this is an interesting uh, – I wouldn't call it conspiracy – Theory per se, but it definitely. It's okay. you know, I'm, I'm down for it. conspiracy uh, theories, so there we go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's it, it's entirely possible. It definitely raised the hairs on the back of my neck when I when I first heard about this. Uh, I don't have any hard evidence, uh, especially because uh, we don't have a ruling yet. But I did speak with uh, Crossfire's attorney uh, Lance Reich, who who was as suspicious as I was uh, of the timing of this <laughs> announcement. Um, Again, we don't have any information that says that it's going to uh, prevail, but Lance does – he is expecting a more favorable ruling on the Yedlin case than he obviously got on the Dempsey-Bradley cases. Um, those two were dismissed, I think, more on technical grounds, um, not on the merits of the case. Uh, basically, those cases were dismissed because uh, we believe that the uh, that the documentation that uh, pro- uh, the Sockers and the Dallas Texans had – to prove that uh, Dempsey and Bradley were with with their academies during the times uh, were incomplete, to say the least. In fact, there were no records of their time with the youth academies uh, from U.S. soccer because U.S. soccer wasn't keeping those records uh, up until about 2016 uh, in any comprehensive way. So um, Yedlin, I think uh, we're expecting a favorable ruling, so it wouldn't be surprising if MLS had decided that we need to get ahead of things on this. But again, to be a little bit fair to MLS, Garber had been talking about wanting to do this for some time in, in the uh, December at the State of the League. He said they need to figure out how to be more of a selling league, and that obviously uh, you know, means prov- um, you know, protecting your investments in, in youth academy development, which they have spent a significant amount of money on uh, trying to do, you know, bring up more youth kids um, through their ranks and get them on their MLS teams. And with the most famous example being Weston McKinney having left Dallas um, and moved on for nothing. Dallas was uh, poised to get absolutely nothing um, from his leaving the academy um, or from an eventual sale if he gets sold later on down the line. And so this will allow uh, MLS or, and the Dallas to at least get the solidarity uh, portion of that money if Weston McKinney is eventually sold from Schalke to, you know, you know, say Dortmund or Chelsea or whoever down the line. If he's sold for $50 million, you can – do the math, and FC Dallas is going to – they're yeah, – they'd be uh, quite stupid to uh, pass up that chunk of change. That's a, that's a way to put it. That's well done. Um, I, I wanted to ask <laughs> – you said U.S. soccer keeps the records. Um, is that the player passport that, that uh, has been kind of Correct. more central to the conversations? So does that mean like I, – I guess that's one that I still don't know much about. I've tried to read more on the player passport and what that actually is. So you said U.S. soccer keeps the records. Is it the responsibility of the player to sort of make sure those records are up to date? Is it the individual clubs that the player has played for? Like, Do you, do, do you have an understanding of what goes into the actual – player passport yeah so it's a little complicated um made even more so by the fact that uh, uh u.s soccer has completely revamped their system um yeah I, I would as i said until about 20 let's say 2014 2015 their record keeping was was shoddy to say the best and they they've admitted this that they were just not keeping records some of that was just due because uh, due to the fact that mls did not have academies and they weren't really concerned about keeping those records because they weren't really moving players on uh, either through sale or, and they weren't collecting solidarity payments and training compensation. So um, it, it's, it's ultimately U S soccer's uh, responsibility to have these records in sort of a clearinghouse. And they have that now, which is it's called U S soccer connect. And they basically are now tracking all youth movement um, throughout the country. And they expect, I think they they're up to about 2 million uh, active youth participants right now that they have uh, cataloged um, in that database. And that information generally, and I've, I've seen a copy of the Yedlin passports, and I say plural because he had two, because the first one was incomplete and they had to go back in and correct it. And it's got your basic information, you know, the name of the player, uh, date of birth, uh, date he was at each club, and date he left each club. And it, you know, the, those clubs need to, I think the bottom line is the clubs need to, those youth clubs uh, need to submit that information to U.S. soccer 
And from there, U.S. Soccer needs to keep tabs on that information through their database, which, uh, which again, they instituted uh, last year. And so it, it, it's before then, it's just difficult to say who was actually responsible for what because no one was doing much of anything. Um, and so everyone probably deserves a little bit of the blame for not keeping, uh, keeping those records. The youth clubs for not submitting that information um, and that uh, U.S. Soccer for not cataloging that information. And the other problem was that, you know, youth players were moving around so much. You go, you can go from like three teams in six months um, and not, and maybe you're only there for like a couple of, a couple of weeks or maybe a weekend or something like that. I actually, yeah, I talked to MLS about this and they basically said you know, they had, they had these issues where uh, players were just moving from team to team um, on kind of a weekly, weekly basis or moving from the U S development Academy um, at Bradenton and then going to play with like uh, the FC Dallas Academy for a weekend. Do you have to catalog that? Mm -hmm. um, and how does that, how would that calculate into solidarity payments? You're going to uh, do a calculation for someone going, going and playing for a weekend. Uh, and so all of those kind of things made it just very difficult uh, back, you know, back in the uh, dark ages uh, to just, you know, get the, keep that information together. So I think uh, there's now an edict from FIFA. There was an edict from FIFA. I know that for sure. To basically say, get your act together, uh, U.S. Soccer, and and they have since done that, but um, that doesn't really help any of the previous cases. Um, anything before 2014, it you know, it's just impossible to go back and try to recreate those records. And then, how quickly do you think we see a challenge to this change in policy? And what do you think that entails? Uh, when you and Paul wrote about this for the Athletic, I think you all mentioned some antitrust lawsuits. I know the MLS Players Association is not a big fan of this. I'm wondering if they're going to challenge it on like freedom of movement grounds or something like that. Oof, yeah, this is you know, the players' association is is just not they're they're you know pissed. I guess is, is the way to put it. <laughs> it's the legal term. I, I, I think. Good, yeah, I good, yeah, that's a legal term. But I had a good twenty minute conversation with uh with the folks over there, and they they were just not happy. They actually called me up uh, to talk to me for uh for the story, and you know they have long opposed this. Uh, based on you know the player movement grounds you kind of mentioned, um, as well as uh, antitrust uh, issues, the, the the problem for them is that uh, they do not believe they can sue directly um, as a union on these ground, uh, on antitrust grounds. They said they would support a lawsuit from somebody else. So the question is obviously who else would sue, and what you'd essentially have to find, I think, is a player, a youth player, who had opportunities overseas, um, who was in an MLS academy. And but for the fact that uh, the MLS Academy or the Youth Academy, I guess, uh, if it was independent, but for one of those academies uh, pursuing the claim, uh, they would have been able to go. So basically, uh, you know, uh, let's say a Schalke looks at a player um, in an academy and says, oh, we'd like to we'd like to bring them over, but we don't want to pay 40 or 80 thousand dollars a year. So we're going to pass. And that player then ends up with no options overseas and then says, no, well, now I have to stay with my MLS Academy because I don't have any overseas options and you've restricted my trade unfairly and uh, therefore I'm going to sue. So you have to find a player who has actually been damaged uh, by uh, by this change in policy to go sue. I'm not sure you could uh, get someone uh, – I'm not sure you could sue on the uh, prospect that, yeah, it could happen in the future without an actual injured party. Um, that would be an interesting uh, legal uh, discussion to have. But uh, at this point, uh, the, the uh, MLS Players Association is not going to be the plaintiff to a lawsuit, but they are exploring their options. Um, and so we'll have to see uh, if they ultimately decide that, to move forward. And we also have to see how this is implemented by MLS um, and uh, wh how what U.S. soccer's role is going to be in this going forward. Because uh, if you read the story, uh, you know that they are very reluctant to get involved in this in any way. Well, Mickey Turner has got the knowledge, obviously. Um, there do seem to be about like a hundred or more soccer-related lawsuits in the U.S. You do a great job of explaining them in your article. Is it uh, your guide to every soccer lawsuit in the U.S.? Is that what it is? Yep. And beyond, of course. And beyond, of course. Uh, they are all over the place. Um, are there any other ones, uh, before I let you go, are there any other ones that are particularly interesting that we haven't yet discussed? Or do you just um, want to tell we, people to go to the, the website? That's fine too. You can do that. No, 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 no. Uh, I think we can hit on most of uh, the more interesting ones. Um, and uh, you know, the inner Miami stuff is just the most interesting to me because obviously it has the chance to impact whether they can even get a team up and running for next year. Because mm -hmm. if they end up losing that injunction and aren't unable to 
uh, you know, demolish Lockhart and get the stadium up. Then the question is, what do they do at that point? Because they don't have a place to play. And they've already foreclosed, as, a, as we talked about earlier, a couple of other stadiums in the area. The only one remaining is Hard Rock, which uh, for reasons, uh, you know, it's an actually, it's a great, it'd be a great stadium to have a temporary soccer venue. But it is owned by Stephen Ross, who's actually the who owns Relevant Sports, ah. who is now suing U.S. Soccer. <laughs> um, and I think at some point, one was interested in MLS as well. So, I, who knows if they could even you know put together a deal on that front? So, uh, you know, again, it, it's highly unlikely that Inter Miami doesn't come in 2020. There's nothing that says nothing that has led anyone to believe that MLS is even contemplating that. But uh, with all of those lawsuits and Melry still up in the air, uh, it's definitely one to look out for. So if they win the loss, if they win the injunction um, and are able to start uh, construction, then it, you know, it'll all work out fine. But if, if it doesn't, uh, then, you know, Katie bar the door because, uh, you, know, you know, all hell could break loose. And if it doesn't, then I'm assuming you'll be writing about it. Uh, if people want to uh, hear more from you or read more from you, how can they find you? Yeah, you can uh, find me on the website at SoccerESQ.com. Uh, I'm always on Twitter, uh, Turner ESQ, uh, which is where I post most of the you know the breaking stuff uh, that comes up uh, day in and day out. And it seems every day there's something coming out on one of these lawsuits. And then, of course, I'm also writing for The Athletic, uh, uh, doing contributions there. And I also write for Sounder at Heart, uh, covering more Sounders-specific stuff. And then eventually you sleep? Yes, eventually. Uh, between the hours of uh, about 3 and 5 a.m. There we go. Dinner, I, I, 45 minutes. Uh, well, well I, I appreciate that very much. I appreciate you taking all the time to make sense a lot of this because I've had many of these questions I've been reading about and been like, I just don't get it. So I appreciate that you were able to make sense of it all. Mickey Turner, thank you very much again for your time. Uh, pleasure. Anytime. Anytime.